Yeah, Alan from Quai Network here. So co-founder of the project since about uh, 2018 is when we got started. So myself and Dr. K and a few other people, mainly around the University of Texas at Austin. So it was a research project. And we got together around the idea of scaling blockchains and what does it look like to create a public blockchain that's permissionless, censorship resistant, but also can scale up to 50k TPS. So the core ethos is really trying to be a last mover in the space and take all the learnings from other projects in order to create something that is is awesome. And we think we're getting really close to that. Uh, myself at the time, I was a student at UT, so I was studying computer science, was always super interested in blockchain research, was really diving in from a first principles perspective on how to make these things happen. And then went after graduation, started my job full time as a software engineer at Apple, and then was there for about a year and a half before leaving Apple, picking up the research again, and taking that full time, getting it from an idea in an incubation into something that is a full fledged launched industry implementation. And yeah, we've been doing that for about two years now, full time. We did our seed round last year. We're backed by Polychain Capital and Alumni Ventures. They've been great supporters of the project and we've been building up a great community. So partnering people like yourself at Galaxy and really getting the train going for mainnet launch is going to be exciting. And I appreciate you having us today and, and glad to share my story. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you uh, obviously decided to, to work with us as well. Um, you know, that's what we, we love to do. Right. So, and I appreciate the nice words and, um, yeah, two, two years is, it's a long grind, honestly. Um, it really doesn't feel like it. Um, when you realize it's two years, I've been with, uh, galaxy for two years. Now nice. too, so it's been, yeah, so it's, well, it's almost two years getting close, but, um, yeah, I feel like three months feels like a year in, in crypto to me. So. Not yeah, sure no, it's, it's, you uh, this. yeah it's, it's similar. two years is like it goes quick and the crazy part is like we didn't realize of course things are difficult right but you never realize how hard it is going to be when you get started so we found a mountain we're going up the mountain and yeah we're gonna gonna just keep keep getting up to the top aiming for that peak no i i, I respect that it's tough it's um it's difficult but um that's why we're here we, we love the difficult things because it makes us better and it makes us grow um so yeah, let's kind of dive into Quai Network, or is it Quai or Quai? Quai? Quai. We've, we've actually, you know, sort of crafted it from a myriad of, of meanings. So the first one is Quai, and it K-U-A-I, which is the colloquial term for buck in Mandarin Chinese. So it's a form of money saying in Mandarin. And oh. we've sort of adapted the K-U-A-I and just put a Q on the front sounds the same quai and the second yeah. is if you're in you know france or, or europe or, or switzerland you'll see the quai is like a port or you know a, a close to the the sea so it's, it's like a loading station or also you know like side mm -hmm. area to the ocean and so that being like a platform so another sort of saying in, in that language and then the third being fast also in mandarin so we like to consider Quai being a fast money platform, sort of in the short sense of the word. No, that's cool. I, li I like that there's so much to the name. Um, a lot of the time, I find that a lot of projects will be like, this is just like fun and it's it fits into the space kind of thing. But when there's a lot of like uh, little little quirks behind the name, uh, I like that a lot. That's fun. That's actually uh, the, the person who asked that question. He's actually our, our best question asker. So you can prepare it to see uh, probably a few more from him as well. Uh, thanks for the question, Alex Cat. I'll keep my eye on the on the chat a little bit. I know we had some questions planned, but also I think that's just a fun one to get started with, to get familiar with, no, of course. with the project yeah, no. and, and, and kind of tee it up in that regard. No, I completely agree. Pretty much we do obviously have some prepared, of course, and, and we'll, we'll go over those and kind of through the you know, the inner workings, everything. Um, but also, yeah, we do have some great question askers in the chat. So I might throw some in and you can also feel free to interject. And if you want to answer any of these right away too, not a problem. Um, so yeah, first, and obviously I might um, as well ask you to explain some things that maybe not common knowledge, uh, like terminology to, you know, more intricate things to the users here is, you know, I, not everybody is super tech oriented. Um, but yeah, please, could you give us your kind of best intro to uh, Quai Network. 
Sure. So the way I like to describe Quai at a first glance is we want to be as decentralized as Bitcoin, as composable as Ethereum, and as fast as Solana. In the essence, that sort of sums up the blockchain trilemma. And without getting too technical, there's this bounds of physical limitations that are defining the blockchain space as we know it today. And with Quai being a new layer one project, we want to try to optimize the performance of blockchains in this space. And of course, knowing you know, classic trade-offs, you have to fall somewhere in that trilemma. But what we've actually done is we've operated in a new sort of paradigm or a new sort of technological trade-off in which we've introduced a few key concepts. And so for a layer one blockchain, you really have to think of it you know, as the main platform for all the applications to be built on. And these trade-offs define user experience, they define how people want to use the platform, and they define sort of the longevity of the project as well, because blockchains are really hard to modify when you launch them. And so if you're starting a new layer one or a new layer two, you really have to think about these things because down the line, a hard fork is extremely difficult. And, you know, mm -hmm. not to say that that haven't happened before, but, you know, they can divide the community, they can cause misalignment, and a, a bunch of other problems that are, are generally bad. Yeah. And so when you look at what we're doing with Quai, is we're, again, optimizing for that throughput while maintaining decentralization in the layer one itself. And we do that by having horizontal sharding, so execution-based sharding. We do that by having a process called merged mining. And we do that by having a new novel consensus mechanism called proof of entropy minima, which essentially is the idea of instantaneous fork resolution in a hierarchy based off of a very, not simple, because it's actually pretty, and it, it, it's, it's, I, I won't go too far mm -hmm. on Poem to get started. We can get into it, into it a little later. But essentially, it allows us to have consensus that isn't bounded by time. And it allows blocks to be chosen sort of in a, in a st style that allows them to be instantaneously resolved. So mm -hmm. it improves finality, it improves latency, and it improves the way for us to introduce more of these horizontal shards into that execution environment uh on the project itself you know people have been following us for about a year now the community has gotten relatively large so we're approaching mainnet getting to mainnet after our test nets that's the main priority we when you're developing these systems you have to be very very thorough just because again as i said hard forks are bad for the community but also you're building financial software and we take that very seriously so ramping up to mainnet getting through our next three test nets. Our next test net publicly is announced for September 19th. So that'll be an incentivized test net for people to participate, mine, quai, build dApps, and use the tools. So I think that part's going to be exciting. And outside of that as well, uh, great team. So pretty small team of everyone. We have about 20 on our team right now, but always looking for skilled people to join the mission. Yeah, I feel like once you get to... Uh like kind of more of like a full launch um and things do get even more exciting you'll you'll, you'll uh, need a lot of yeah there'll be a lot of new team members joining um it happened for us as well where it was like oh wow we are it's going fast now we, we definitely need some more people um no that's that's very interesting would you would you mind um covering sort of uh you, you mentioned merge mining and horizontal sharding would you mind giving sort of just like a little uh explanation of what those two things are yeah totally so that gets us i said i would go too deep into poem but that gets us into that next sort of step so merge mining is not a new idea it's been around since about 2012 same with sharding and these two technological philosophies and how they're applied to blockchain again have their own merit so merge mining actually has been implemented in Dogecoin and Litecoin. So Dogecoin is actually merge mined on top of Litecoin and Namecoin and Bitcoin. So these are things that Satoshi was talking about in Bitcoin form in 2011. Again, not new. The idea of merged mining is combining these blockchains and mining them simultaneously. So you're reusing hash rate to secure both of these blockchains. And you can do that by having rewards or the mining rewards for each of these applied to the person that is mining both of those chains. And also you can have that dictated in sort of a general consensus applied to both of these chains as well. The hard part about classical merge mining in the sense is these two blockchains, say in the case of Dogecoin and Litecoin, have different tokens and they have different philosophical 
sort of economics, right? Like the Litecoin community is different from the Dogecoin community, but also, you know, their supply is different. They have different sort of, at the end of the day, they're just merged mine together. So they share some similarities and they share some reuse of security, but at a high level, you know, they're not too similar. When you look at combining that philosophy of merged mining with sharding, sharding allows you to actually have the same token across these different shards. It allows you to increase the throughput by creating more block space and having more people be able to submit transactions across these shards. And it allows you to essentially, again, uh, take that old idea. Sharding's been around since about 2014. It was in the original Ethereum roadmap. And it, you can go ahead and create that new form of consensus by combining those. So that's the high level on sharding and, and merge mining. Mm -hmm. Sharding has been attempted by a lot of different blockchains were unique in the fact that we do execution sharding rather than just sort of parallel execution. So if some people will do parallel execution and call it sharding. That's not really good use of the term. Some people will also do some sort of sharding that isn't really applicable to throughput. So they'll shard it and then it'll be just as slow as a non-sharded blockchain. Again, we're taking a form of approach that actually utilizes the full compute mm -hmm. and processing on the computer. So being able to run multiple shards on different computers in disparate locations. And then some people will also just get one big blockchain and not change anything and, and say, this is good enough like Bitcoin. So we're really trying to optimize on all cylinders. You know, I, I agree. And I think it is, you know, it's pretty easy for, you know, I, I guess people in just in general to get close, right? And then just use the phrase, obviously. Um, but I appreciate the the level of seriousness that you guys give, obviously, you know, using these terms and, and what they are, and, you know, to the fullest extent. Um, and now you, you did answer a few questions in the chat with that response and did kind of lean into another question that we kind of wanted to cover, just kind of covering the uniqueness of Quai Network compared to, you know, those around you that may be doing what you are trying to do. And so, um, at the same time, this is a, a, a kind of mixes into the audience questions that were kind of around <clears throat> the uh, how, how fast you are, et cetera. You mentioned, you know, one of the things that makes you unique. What else about Quai Network kind of stands out above the rest? And, you know, how do you manage to to stay faster than everyone else? Yeah, I mean, I, I talked a bit about that last move revenge earlier, but that, that's a pretty fun thing to to sit and be able to look at implementations and what went right, what went what didn't go right mm -hmm. and the ch chain itself can achieve the scale because of proof of work proof of work is an objective finality that essentially allows the energy of the world to be put into something that essentially makes it more robust and with that objective approach to proof of work you can bring in these shards and it's been a really tough problem to solve in an industry because everyone says, well, how do I shard and scale a blockchain? And you get a lot of different approaches. So one will be, like again, like I said earlier, for Bitcoin, they're going to make a big blockchain, not change it, and you're good, and we're happy with it because blockchains are slow and they should be stupid. There's other approaches, like Ethereum, where they say, we'll get a bunch of layer twos and they'll settle data onto Ethereum, and that's fine because the gas costs are going to rise and we want everyone to have expensive fees and the data is only going to be the thing stored on Ethereum. Yeah. Then there's the other approaches, such as Cosmos or Avalanche or Polkadot, that say we'll create these other blockchains and they'll be considered you know, somewhat L1s on the sense that they're tied to these other blockchains, but they really are disparate and misaligned, sort of a hodgepodge network of similarly L2s. So they're not really L1s in any, any sense there. And for us, we can create that scale because we're not creating new tokens on top of Quai outside of smart contracts, of course, but the actual mechanism of scale is still the Quai token. So everything that is native to that tokenomic plan, everything that is native to the sharding approach, and we can go and create that block space without misaligning incentives. And the way we can do that is through that sharding and merged mining. And so, you know, someone in the comments sort of said, how do you achieve the infinite scale? And that infinite scale is done through the coordination of those shards through proof of work. And that is a really key part into how we can actually coordinate these blockchains is because the objectivity in coordination is very important. And I talked a little bit earlier mm -hmm. about removing time. 
So taking time out of consensus. And if you have time, that introduces subjectivity because clocks and computers aren't precise. People with differing opinions on how things should be processed, hard to coordinate. And also if you introduce any sort of redundancy, if you don't introduce any sort of redundancy there, it gets really messy really fast. If you don't have something that everyone can look at and say, this is the answer. And for proof of entropy minima, the way we can do that is by removing entropies from the system and having proof of work be the thing that allows people to coordinate. And the poem consensus is essentially trying to minimize the entropy. And if you think about an example with like say generating a seed phrase, you want to maximize the entropy because you don't want anyone to know it. But in this sort of blockchain system with something that's public and agreeable, and you want everyone to come to consensus on it, you want everyone to look at it and say, that's the right thing to choose. You want to minimize that entropy. And we do that by actually coordinating based off of the block hashes and by the amount of leading zeros in an instantaneous block. And then that approach is iterated and it's actually done in a multiplicative process across the chains and the blocks that have been built on top of them in order to achieve essentially a new type of longest chain rule, which is similar to the classical Nakamoto consensus. Interesting. Wow. So, so okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm just making sure I'm, I'm getting it right. Um, no, no, okay, okay. No, I, I, th I think I got it. Thank you. Um, you take a lot of different aspects from from so many different areas in the in the process. Like, how long would you say has it been something that you've kind of been working on over a long period of time to get to this this point of taking all these different pieces, or was that the whole idea of utilizing all these different things kind of from the start, or was it something you sat on for a long time? Well, that's a good question, and I know I just info dumped, so interject no, and touch okay. back on 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 whatever we need to, but. It's been a long journey, as I said earlier. So two years since I left Apple, essentially, and came back yeah. and started working on the project. And since about 2018, actually, it was more of a research project. So like I said, we were at UT Austin. We were just kind of tinkering and saying, well, there's something here. There's an idea. And we want to explore it. Well, how do we do that? So we get some groups together. We get a lab together. We work on it. We, you know, we'd go back. I had school. So you know, I was taking classes also at the time and other people had full-time jobs and our professors had classes to teach. So it was really us on like by the end of the week. I'm sorry, there's sitting outside. So there's bugs and stuff. <laughs> no, but, no uh, problem. I could hear it. I could hear it. Sorry, that's okay. Cool. Uh, but, you know, we had classes and, and normal things to get back to. So it'd be like Saturday night. Like, what are we doing? Either we're going to the bar or we're going to go work on the blockchain. We're going to go do some research. And oftentimes it was just us essentially tinkering with how to put these ideas together. And we came to a really good conclusion in that we could. And we published papers and we really pushed the industry, I think, forward, especially in Austin. And we mm -hmm. were also having meetups and really trying to educate people on how blockchain works, what it is, and how they could you know, benefit from it and how the world could benefit from sound, decentralized money. And, you know, from about 2018 was when we started. 2019 was the first paper that we published called block reduce which is the application of sharding and merge mining and top topological distributed groups and then 2020 the group continued to work on it we received the national science foundation grant from uh the, from the u.s government so that was, yeah that was sbir phase one and then uh yeah just kept kept iterating on it i like i said went to apple so either a uh, a mistake or the time to learn in a big company one of the two but it was just too exciting to to not be working on it. So then I came back. But yeah, it's been about five years in total, probably. And I think right now it's at the, of course, the closest we've been to to getting the the core thing finalized. But you know, no, it's no, a, it's, it's been a it sounds been a long like time coming. So it's been fun. Yeah, it's. I mean, when you it's something you love though, like that, like it's it could take all the time in the world, right? When you you have right. that angle. Um, no, thank you. That's a great explanation. I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, obviously, we might we might touch back on a, on a few things, of course, as we go through um, you know the upcoming questions, as well as some from the chat. A quick question that I think is pretty interesting that I saw from Alex earlier. Um, Quiet Network claims that its mining process is up to ten thousand times more energy efficient per transaction um, compared to other networks like Bitcoin. Of course, how is this level of efficiency achieved? 
and what metrics are used to measure it. So you, a lot of people usually don't ask about, um, you know, obviously energy efficiency. So I'm just curious on that as well, if you have, if you have that info for us. Yeah. So I'm an energy maxi. I think the world should be energy, energy abundant in that we should do everything we can to maximize our energy production. And the way you have to do that is by incentivizing energy consumption to have max net energy production. And I think, of course, across those energy sources, you have wind, solar, hydrothermal, uh, a mix of all sorts of renewables that are emerging, nuclear and other types. And when you look at energy efficiency, when it comes to blockchain, you have to sort of take it into different approaches where we can either use as little energy as possible because we want the chain to be socially defined by consensus, a la proof of stake, or we can utilize the objective nature of energy and apply that with proof of work. Bitcoin, us, other proof of work chains, of course, take that approach. The way we can achieve energy efficiency here is by increasing that throughput and increasing the amount of transactions. And so net, of course, we want to be comparable to Bitcoin in regards to robustness and decentralization, because as you saw, or as everyone sees with Bitcoin, it is proven to be robust and resilient to sort of geopolitical affairs. China bans Bitcoin mining. All of the Bitcoin miners move to Texas. Mm -hmm. That's a known fact. Yeah. We've known that yeah. happens. And for us, we really appreciate the fact that proof of work gives that ability to be resilient. And people can go tap into energy anywhere. And it incentivizes people to go tap into energy. So whether you're doing Bitcoin mining on volcanoes, or you're using some solar farms out in West Texas. We think that's great. It stabilizes mm -hmm. the grid. It goes and actually creates the incentive for people to get out and use those renewable energy sources. And then if you're using those renewable energy sources, you can actually connect them back to the grid when it makes the most sense to do so. And energy efficiency wise, there's only really a small amount of renewables you need on a blockchain to make it either carbon neutral or carbon negative. And Bitcoin right now, I believe, has about 1% to 2% of people doing methane mitigation. That's a whole other avenue we can get into, but essentially methane mitigation and methane mining is tarping a landfill and taking that tarped methane and putting it into a generator. Once you got it on the generator, you can power anywhere from you know 3 to 5 megawatt site, which can do about also 400 miners. So that number, again, 400 miners out of a system that is potentially thousands is a a pretty small percentage, but that's enough to make the blockchain actually carbon negative because of the impacts methane have on the environment. Methane being about 35 times more potent than CO2 in the atmosphere yeah. when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. So just like that, those kind of stats, we, we keep at the top of our, our mind and we're always really focused on being extremely energy efficient. But again, efficiency is a small part and it, it's, a, it's a price you have to pay for having sound money and having mm -hmm. the money and the incentive in place will essentially allow everything else to come again from first pr first principles when you think about it that way. But yeah, that's uh, again on the on the number two, you can say X amount more efficient than Bitcoin just because of, of throughput as well. So per transaction is, is a similar way of thinking about it. No, I, I, I like that. I think it's an interesting point that a lot of people ig ignore, honestly, um, is the energy consumption discussion. Um, you know what what these things do environmental wise when it comes to energy consumption what energy we're using um and, and even myself for the longest time i i never really thought about it uh it was just sort of something i never paid attention to i feel like a lot of people as um you know we just kind of live our lives we just recycle the best we can and not really think about it <laughs> that's partially why um we have so many, many obviously problems i would say at this point um and yeah it was a uh, Funny just to to know, you know, a big reason why I started thinking about it was when I was in crypto and, and you know, really kind of diving into it. Um, and, you know, this was during obviously like, you know, the hot period where everything was kind of crazy. And, um, you know, I, I would talk to people that didn't know about crypto and had obviously heard about it just due to the news. And, you know, one of the big discussions was like people were mad about what we were doing due to energy consumption and pollution, et cetera. Um, and, you know, so, yeah, it definitely opened my eyes a lot to that as well. So, I, I, yeah, I appreciate you going into the, the details on that. I find a lot of people are just completely um, unbeknownst to it at all. So it, it is a very good discussion to have for sure. So, yeah, thank you for that. Alan. Yeah, of course. 
So we have a question that segues into my next question, actually. So I'll shout out Miss Angel in the chat. Thank you for that. And I appreciate you guys participating and being so active with the questions today. You guys are going nuts in the chat. And I believe we have quite actually a few people hopping in from your community as well. So um, just nice. want to give a little quick shout out. Thank you guys in the chat for answering any questions um, for the mods from, from Kwai, as well as those that are asking questions today. So Miss Angel is curious on kind of an overview of the Iron Age testnet. Um, it's significant in the development and progress. Um, and then, you know, my question, obviously, to piggyback off Miss Angel is, um, you know, what kind of uh, point are we at in the, the testnet schedule? Is uh, how many are we going to see leading towards the end of the year? Um, and, you know, uh, how fast will this ramp up? Yeah, great question. So the Iron Age is extremely monumental to us because as we've gone through the research, we've had to take this idea and put it into code and put it into that robust and secure implementation that we believe is trusted. And we believe the community will have faith in as well and have that assurance that we're really building something great because we believe we are and we want everyone to think the same as well. We've gone through rigorous testing internally. So we've actually started with internal dev nets that we've been running for about the past two months and we've scaled up our infrastructure it's that kind of stuff in a startup where you're like oh shit i just got slapped with a one hundred thousand dollar gcp bill and of course that's a hyperbolous example but that kind of stuff where you're like just iterating too fast and you can go and see all the software run you can see all the instances run and in the back of your mind you have to think like wow this is awesome there's these many computers all around the world that are coordinating in this way that hasn't been done before that is unique and that is freaking awesome and the Iron Age testnet will be the public being able to permissionly join and leave this network as they choose. And the beautiful thing about a blockchain is if you really think about it, the way it evolves over time, and this might be super meta, but the way it evolves over time is nodes consistently join and leave. And this thing just continually evolves. And it doesn't matter how or when or what you're running. As long as you're downloading the blocks, validating the transactions, and executing that software, I can run a blockchain node for a month, or I can run it for the whole time it's been a, been running. And that's a beautiful thing. And the Iron Age testnet will allow people to join, mine, participate, develop, engage, all of the things. Mm -hmm. And really, since the prior two testnets, we've revamped all of Quai, the core code. So we've stripped it all out, we made it as fast and as, from our standpoint, easy to read as possible, because that's a really nice thing about having good code, is it's easy to read and it's easy to explain. And we want that to be part of the Iron Age as well, where people can join the GitHub and contribute and create that actual community, and having people that can be interested enough to contribute in an open source manner. That's another piece that we think is really important to having something permissionless. Yeah, being being open source and, and, and pushing that ethos. That's what we want out of the community as well. So when it comes to projects and people that are building dApps, well, we want you to have an open source repo. You want, we to have, we want you to have a website. We want you to sort of think from those beliefs as well because that just benefits everybody if you create something really interesting. And the moat shouldn't be being closed source. And beyond that, the next test nets in it, roadmap wise we have two more following the iron age and the point of them is to really finalize the sort of auxiliary pieces of why so the core piece being poem being the consensus of sharding and merge mining that's what we're testing this iron age the remaining pieces is really up for us to figure out the bells and whistles that we want before mainnet and so is that going to be designing the smart contract system we want it to be evm compatible we are evm compatible with solidity but what does that look like in our design does that mean we're wasm based are we an e-wasm flavor or is there potentially something we want to do with zk and privacy again those are open questions and we're still looking internally and saying well Figuring how do we out. take that approach right because yeah. at the end of the day once you launch quad you can't just be like all right we're going to take out the evm like no like that just isn't really doable from a launched blockchain perspective there are people that are, have done it, and they've also, there have been people that have added the EVM. But the main thing you really need from that approach is just solidity compatibility, people to deploy and build these protocols. And then beyond that, we need, of course, everyone asks about tokenomics, but finalizing tokenomics. When we say we're working on tokenomics, we're not just talking about putting numbers on a pie chart and saying this is how much goes to testnet incentives <laughs> or this is how much goes to the team. No, that's, that's not what we're talking about in regards to tokenomics at all. What we're actually talking about is how do we utilize proof of work 
create a form of money that is potentially tied to the growth rate of the network or potentially to the price of energy or to the sort of stability of energy in the system. And we're lo looking at running those algorithms. We're looking at running the calculations on that. What does it look like to emit in regards to your hash rate growth or sort of do a type of supply mission that's unique to Kwai rather than just being like, okay, we're going to be Bitcoin and every four years we'll have. We don't yeah. know why we do that, but that's just what we do. And similar to other protocols like Monero that have a tail emission because they are proof of work and they need that minor incentive long term. But what does a tail emission look like and what way is that implemented over time in a logarithmic or in a you know sort of linear fashion? And yeah, those are the questions we're answering. That'll likely get tested in the fourth test net. And then the fifth test net is basically, okay, we're good. We think we have all of the features that we want implemented, but let's do one last test net just to ensure that you know nothing goes awry ahead of mainnet. So that's our that's the timeline. No, of course. No, and and I I really I really it's very refreshing. I, I like the seriousness that you give to to every question and, and every piece. Um, I, I appreciate the the nod to the pie chart. That's such a funny one. Um, <laughs> it's so easy. Yeah, you're you're right. It is honestly a lot of a lot of people will ask that question and not realize that it can go so much further than just a pie chart where X goes where, right? Um, and and it is important. So um, yeah, I mean, because at the end of the day, if we do it in our approach, yeah. the pie chart might not even be relevant yeah, because yeah, exactly you know, we we can design a system that people can control the net ending based off of growth. And again, this is all super preliminary and, and it, it's just the start and I'm just riffing on some of the ideas that we wrote, but if, if you can create a token that actually is incentivizing people to get it as wide as possible and as, as large as possible for the project, because it's gonna influence the way that the token's used, and then also essentially giving people the proper allocation in regards to that energy production, and that energy consumption and utilizing the chain. So I, I think, you know, there's a really beautiful way in which this all kind of tunnels down. And then it also relates back to Poem and the way that we can actually apply entropy and all of these. And then just having it be based on that. It, there's just a few simple formulas that actually sort of ebb and flow throughout a lot of these things. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it's cool to see. Of course, you can tell I get pretty excited about it. But there's no, a, get, a few I other pieces, too. That. Yeah, there's a, there's a few there's a few uh, rabbits in the hat that we're going to have for, for some of these features on Kwai that are all related to utilizing the, the entropy and utilizing the way that this kind of settles down. No, I, I agree. And um, yeah, the, just the piece you mentioned about, you know, obviously you can make a pie chart, you can make a graph, et cetera. Um, and it might not even be that way down the line. I completely agree. And then uh, a lot of people just got very like stuck in the standard, I would say of like, here's this project, here's what the token does, here's where the amounts go, here's the roadmap done. But it's, it's, it's so much more than that at the end of the day. If you like go through the process, like so many things change, so many things tweak, ideas change, um, outcomes change. Like it's it's so tough to give like a concrete image of what a person wants to see and have it be accurate and, and you know, have it make sense. So yeah, I, I, it is tough, yeah. And um, I, it, there is so much more to it than just obviously the images we see and what we put out and many people's minds coming together, so. Yeah, it's, it's a crazy process, I guess, is, the, is what I'm shortening it up to. No, totally. Um, and that's why, you know, we say we need, how long does it take? It takes, it takes a long time to, to build a good system. But we're, we're really close to giving people the ability to come in and, and look at that and look at the hard work. And I think that yeah. part's cool. So at some point, you got to stop going from research and you got to get it out there. And, and this is one of those milestones that we're going to be able to make that conversion. No, I, I, I completely agree. Um, and yeah, there's many, many, there's many sleepless nights that go into it for sure <laughs> in that process. Um, so we talked a bit about the test net, of course, kind of covered, you know, the different things we're going to be, you're going to be working on in the test net, things people can test out, questions that are going to be answered. Um, now, at the same time, this is a incentivized test net. Um, so I was wondering if you could cover the specific activities, tasks um, that will be incentivized during this test net and kind of the details on that process. Yeah, so as I said earlier, the primary thing that we want to test out is the consensus, so running Poem in a distributed way. So the first and foremost thing that we're going to be rewarding is actually mining on the network. And that's the most objective and easiest thing to look at because we can say, your address mined these blocks. There you go. Done. And we utilize a mechanism of proof of work 
and our hash function is called progpal, so programmatic proof of work. It is an adaptation of fhash, and it was actually on the Ethereum proof of work roadmap. So the people that were in that camp, they said we want to evolve fhash and make it look like progpal and implement this into our systems. The reason why it's a better extension of fhash is because it actually adapts more of the calls to the GPU, and it invokes those in a way that is more sort of intensive on the GPU itself. So if you were to design an ASIC, it would have to essentially look like a GPU, is what ProgPal allows you to do. FHash is very similar to that, but again, ProgPal just invokes more of the individual calls. We Mm -hmm. have open source miners for NVIDIA and AMD, and those are in our GitHub. They've come a long way. Uh, You can do pool mining on the testnet, but we don't encourage it just because pool mining allocation may not be converted or sort of honored if you go connect to some random pool and you're mining. That might be a bad idea. So we actually do encourage people to run nodes. Uh, Mining is sort of the proxy for running a node just because we can actually look at mining. And we have incentives that we will be or have posted in regards to the allocations split between the, the mining and the other sort of incentivizations. The other ones after mining would be sort of more subjective and looking at dApps and tools and really anything people want to build. We want to go out and really sort of push that forward where even if you don't see something that we've explicitly said, we encourage people to build it because we can likely go back and be like, dude, yeah, this is awesome. Like, let's do some uh, allocation for you just building a sweet project or doing a grant through the foundation and doing a grant for people that are part of the the Genesis program or that want to apply to the grants program. So we want people to be creative. The short answer is, you know, we have predefined incentives for that. The usage incentives are not as well defined just because those are harder to track and they're also harder to, to, you know, do. Yeah, well, they also they're also harder to look at and say, you know, this isn't just spam, right? This isn't just people just submitting a ton of transactions. We want it to be legit, real usage. And of course, you know, on a testnet like this, like maybe that's a good thing if we just have people just blasting away transactions. But we we don't want that to skew the rewards and we don't want that to skew the way people actually contribute. Because if you're a meaningful user and you go and you do a couple transactions, you you know, you have a cup of coffee, you go buy some NFTs or you know, you go do some things on the testnet. And but someone else is actually, you know, spending day in, day out farming all of the rewards that might not be the best thing for the users come mainnet so uh, we're conscious of those things and i know of course other blockchains have had this problem as well and other people that have launched programs have had this problem but we uh are starting with those and then we just want to get creative on on what people can contribute no i I completely agree and that that question of finding a you know the i guess the level of user is something that we've sort of has been like a, a passion of ours it, for the longest time <laughs> is to make a system that can help you find those users, right? Um, and it's tough, it's difficult. We've we've gone through that a lot as well, where, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, like I, th- I think about a year ago, um, the credentials we had then, the system we had then, um, you know, we, we had many campaigns, uh, you know, activities, things like that, events where, you know, there were like, we were teaming up with partners and a lot of users were participating um, you know, but we had to go through that process of figuring out like, oh, these users are just spamming to to try for a reward, right? There's no, right. There's, not, there's not proper interaction. It's more so just kind of like fake interaction. People just, they want the money. And obviously stress testing is nice, but it needs to go further, right? Um, and, you know, you will continue on that goal, of course, um, as obviously I'm going to, the next kind of sort of questions go right into that, uh, talking about um, the rewards program, et cetera, what you guys are doing with Galaxy. So, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's tough. And I, I hope that uh, we, can, we can be that system for you guys as well to help you find those, those power users. Yeah, and I so think far we so have, good. We have a few in our chat, honestly. Some of these, I, I'm reading the chat, obviously, as I'm chatting with you. We have some people from your server that are so proactive in answering <laughs> questions, discussion. You guys are great. So um, I'd say out of, out of the 33 of these that I've done, your community has been the most active in, in our chat so far. So, oh, yeah, um, shout out to Kwai. Uh, a lot of the yeah, time, they're just community. listening. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, shout out. <laughs> yeah. Shout, shout out Pavel, shout out to Kiri, all the mods. And then there's a lot of people that are, you know, super knowledgeable on the space and that want to contribute. And that's the kind of stuff that we're looking for. So, you know, shout out mm-hmm. to everyone that's here and, and paying attention. 
Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate uh, a lot of the quiet mods and other people hopping in. Super awesome to see you guys. Please stick around. Feel free. We do lots of fun stuff around here. Uh, you know, yeah, join in, ask some questions, etc. If you want to chat too, always feel free to reach out. Not a problem. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and dive into sort of the, uh, you know, a, a bit between, you know, the two of our projects. Um, so when it comes to obviously you guys working with us, kind of, uh, would you let us know what that initial process was kind of how that got started and sort of what was the uh you know first kind of uh campaign you, you started rewards program and how did that go about yeah raleigh might yeah. actually I might see that yeah, for I'd you. Love to. yeah absolutely so we launched um our own kind of earn social media rewards program ourselves and underestimated the amount of engagement it would get and therefore the amount of support from our end and not only from a customer support standpoint, but also like a developer running a front end, running a back end, et cetera, et cetera. There's services that does this. We are building a blockchain as Alan's been saying. So that is our core focus. So all of our energy should be towards building that. And we were just starting to have a lot of our energy be pulled into essentially building from scratch what you all do yourselves. And so uh, a member of your team, Jake, I don't know if I should say his name or not, but uh, <laughs> of course, Jake, uh, yeah. I, met, I, I met him at, um, I can't recall what conference, but we met at a conference and he, he saw SM Rewards and was really enthusiastic about it, asking a lot of questions about the success, the pain points, et cetera, et cetera. That's how we got linked up with Galaxy. And he essentially said, you know, we'll, we'll, we can do a lot of this already and we would be willing seeing the success you've had with it we would be willing to um implement some of the features that are missing from our dashboard to help you guys mm -hmm. uh do all the things you want to do from an engagement standpoint a learning standpoint etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's been a long conversation and a lot of work from our end as well as yours yours, sorry, to implement this transition from our SM rewards to Galaxy. So currently all the rewards for us in Galaxy are just um, you know, learning, engaging, joining the community, just getting your ecosystem into ours. Mm -hmm. um, but, but as we approach Testnet, as Alan touched on, um, when we launch Testnet, the first incentives are going to be minor and builder based. And then throughout the test net, we're going to do some drops that are much more user focused um, that we're still trying to work out with our devs as well as your back end on how we can track those power users and not just those spam users like you mentioned yeah, for exactly. um, different user based transactions. So it will be heavily user incentivized. We just haven't announced those specifics because we're trying to figure out the best experience, not just for what we want to test, but for the people that want to participate. So it's not, uh, you know, clunky or clunky. And yeah, it's something, it's not just spamming the network. Oh yeah, of course. And we, we want, that's what we want as well with, with obviously, you know, what, what we're building, right. Is, is, are those kind of campaigns, those kinds of, um, processes. And yeah, no, I've seen, um, I haven't obviously been involved in these chats, but I've been in the chat and I've seen the many <laughs> messages you guys have sent back and forth um you know working out this process and it's so funny every a lot of the time it's it's always um when i ask you know how we got acquainted etc it's always jake jake's a great guy so um it's funny that you've mentioned him yeah um, he is he really is like, i'm guessing it was good. austin probably where he met you guys i'm guessing it might have been singapore actually token 29 last year it might, maybe oh, okay. it might have been okay, right yeah. after that I, I can't recall which conference but it was a conference but I think, you know yeah, the last definitely nearly a year him. now yeah nearly a year now we've been um you know we met up with him to discuss more at east denver at consensus in austin so yeah. we've been um yeah, as you said heavily engaged and i think the reason for that is we've built such as you mentioned and as we mentioned before like we have a very active passionate community yeah, and so um they've helped us so much along the way that we didn't want to just pick something and say, yeah, this is the new one. This is the new thing we're looking at. So we had to mm -hmm. do our own diligence to make sure we were giving um, our community the best partner and the best experience possible. And we just thought that was y'all. No, I, I, I agree. It's, it's what we have to do. It's simple when you really think about it. It's what we have to aim for, right? 
um and yeah I'm, I'm glad you guys you know took that chance with, with us and I'm, and it's been such a engaged conversation so i i know they're uh the the guys on our side are hard workers so um we'll do our best for you in that sense so when it comes to these obviously campaigns that have uh you know obviously been released the three so far and um you know what you guys are working on going forward um and we you know we have our loyalty points as well. Kind of, would you be able to go over what those loyalty points from the Quay space uh, represent for users and how they can utilize those loyalty points going forward? Obviously, as they begin to earn more through the campaigns. Yeah, so the points um, are going to be an aggregate system to that will that will lead to mainnet Quay at our mm -hmm. mainnet date. It's not gonna be a one-to-one -one conversion. There'll be some sort of formula based off engagement and based off of participation. All user-based incentivization going forward will yeah. be done through Galaxy up until mainnet, essentially is what we're saying. Whether that's okay, rewards, cool. points, Perfect. That's or oats. Yeah. Very Yeah, exciting. I mean, it's what, it's what you all do as, again, we're building a, a blockchain we don't need to be running a rewards program so we find <laughs> yeah. a good partner that's writing yourself a bit thin having uh those two uh, different pieces right so yeah you have no idea. no no you it's like the thing where you're like you grow fast and you're just like i guess we got to do this now so like we spent like i became like an expert on like twitter apis and like for some reason i know way more about that system than i should but that yeah, I'm, our, not, our, I'm not even tech oriented at all, and I, I know way too much now at this point. So I, I completely agree. Um, but yeah, very exciting stuff going forward. Um, you know, I'm super excited to see these these loyalty points be used in you know obviously more creative ways. We try to do it ourselves. I find that it's such a tough thing for people to kind of get a hold of idea wise is you know how to better incentivize users. Um, and yeah, something that we're going to you know, obviously continue to work on and, and, and grow over time. So appreciate you guys using the system and, you know, dedicating your time to this as well. Obviously, it's a lot easier than building the system yourself, of course. But, um, you know, yeah. And um, beyond that, I think we're, we're pretty much close to the end of today. Um, you know, as we're kind of closing out, and we've covered the, the many different pieces. I just wanted to thank you guys for coming on. Um, you know, before you guys head out, do you have any kind of final words for everyone today? Um, anywhere you want to guide them to get involved? Yeah, I mean, from my end, Galaxy Radio, Radio episode 33. It's been a blast. We are developing the Iron Age testnet September 19th. You can go to qu.ai, follow along, Twitter. We've... Uh, been growing and we're excited to get the community engaged and stay tuned for more information very much agree. yeah i mean thank you it's it's been great this has been probably my favorite one of these i've done actually the best ran as well thank so you. thank you for that um yeah just like alan said q.ai for the website uh join the server i know they've been dropping links like crazy for it in the chat so just go mm -hmm. find one of those to join <laughs> uh follow us on twitter we have a lot of announcements between now and September 19th for different ways you can earn, engage, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to just keep surprise dropping a lot of fun along the way mm -hmm. and throughout the test net. So, um, yeah, come join. Um, and, and thank you, Kiri. Thank you, Pavel, and everyone in the community for being so active. This is great. Keyshore. Uh, Keyshore's in there, too. Keyshore, all of the mods, you guys are wonderful. And then also for my team, shout out uh, Max and Judy for crushing the integration process. They, they worked really hard with y'all to get this up and running. No, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate the kind words as well. It, it's funny. You, I'm glad you mentioned that. It's, it's, it's a lot more hard work than people realize to do some of these. And uh, in the process, you know, in um, doing AMAs and doing Twitter spaces, it became like for myself kind of like a, a stale space, I would say. So we, with this, like, we just were like, we want to make this present, engaging. Um, and I, I hope that for everyone listening that it was present and engaging. And I just want to thank you guys again for coming on and being awesome guests and, um, you know, giving these detailed explanations, going over these different topics. Um, I learned so much in this process. So that's kind of one of the fun things for myself as well, as being someone who kind of, you know, lived a lot of my life outside of the more tech areas. Um, getting into this has been such a learning experience. So it's been super fun in that aspect. So yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate it.